Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome. Um, my name is Ryan Berg. I'm the director of the Americas program here at CSIS. And I'm just so delighted that we're able to do this event in person. Thank you so much for, for joining us today for a conversation on innovating and expanding access to finance for small-scale agriculture. Before we launch into today's discussion, I'd like to just quickly talk about the logistics. We're going to have a 60-minute event today. And following our moderated discussion up here, we will field questions from the audience. You'll see to the sides of me here, we have two big panels um, where you can submit your questions by scanning the QR code visible on either side with your cell phone camera. You'll then be taken to a web page where you can input a question. If you're out there in our live virtual audience, please submit a question using the Ask Live Questions function on the web page. And please note that the live stream discussion will be made available on the event webpage following the end of this event. Small-scale agriculture is a key link in the global food supply chain. Around the world, the vast majority of farms cultivate less than two hectares of land. These small farms produce roughly a third of all crops globally and employ the bulk of the estimated one billion people who participate in agriculture. However, smallholder farmers also rank among the most vulnerable to economic shocks, from fluctuations in the price of fertilizers, fuel, and seeds, to climate disasters, to inconsistent demand for agricultural commodities, these disruptions fall more heavily upon small-scale operations. Improved access to finance can help farmers prepare for and respond to these shocks. By allowing farmers to invest in climate-resilient seeds or improve storage and transportation facilities to prevent spoilage, financing provides a critical lifeline to insulate the livelihoods of these farmers. Unfortunately, traditional financial institutions have had high barriers to access for most smallholder operations. Two months ago, the CSIS Americas program conducted a series of interviews in Honduras, speaking with government officials, banks, agricultural associations, and NGOs. The findings from this fieldwork revealed challenges shared by farmers the world over, as well as, a unique, as well as unique local patterns, such as the intersections between organized crime and agriculture, as well as a highly liquid banking sector that remains profoundly risk adverse to lending to smallholder farmers. This fieldwork also underscored another crucial dynamic when it comes to providing effective financing to smallholder farmers. Namely, the sheer diversity of these operations means that successful initiatives must begin tailored to on-the-ground contingencies. To help us think through the myriad of regional and local particularities that define small-scale agriculture, we have today a superlative group of speakers. Over the course of our conversation, we will touch on agriculture in Latin America, Africa, South Asia, identifying differences and opportunities, and hopefully arriving upon some common threads to build upon. Before we begin our conversation, I would like to welcome Terry Weir, Senior Vice President of Investment Programs with Heifer International, and a non-resident senior associate with the CSIS Project on Prosperity and Development. Terry has over 25 years of international experience, focusing on public and private sector engagement and development initiatives to catalyze the potential of the private sector as a driver of sustainable and inclusive economic growth. So, Terry, welcome. Thank you very much, Ryan. Um, and thank you all for uh, coming. And those that are um, virtual, thank you for attending as well. Um, I would just like to say a few brief remarks. One, I would like to first thank CSIS and the partnership that we have uh, between Heifer and CSIS. Um, Dan and the entire team have been, been wonderful and done uh, great work in the two documents that were produced for this event. And so if you haven't seen them, they are live on the website. Please have a look at those. Um, and I would also like to thank our distinguished panelists who are here as well. I think Ryan will introduce them individually, but I want to thank you all for um, also attending and really giving your expertise in this field. Um, it's an extremely important um, topic today that we're talking about. Um, Heifer International has been in operation since 1944, so we've been in this business for a long time, and uh, we've worked with 40 million households in that uh, amount of time in those almost 80 years. And we've been assisting with agricultural practices, with inputs, with financing, 
with various aspects of smallholder uh, communities, as well as really um, helping communities from, from really starting from nothing and organizing into co-ops and, and so on and so forth. So we've really been engaged in this, and so we see the, the value in working with smallholders. It is our North Star. Um, our living income methodology is our North Star. So we go into a community and look to help uh, the community get to that living income so that they can put their kids to school, feed their families, and have a better life. Um, Heifer Impact Capital, which I represent, was established about three years ago, and we are now looking to leverage third-party capital so that we can scale our investments across value chains that we operate. So we operate in 20 countries at this point. Um, we're looking to potentially expand those countries as well, but in those countries, much of the work that we do, again, is with the smallholder communities, but we also work across the value chain. So we work with processors, we work with cold storage, we work with um, power, water, and infrastructure as well. Um, we also have an organization called Heifer Labs, which looks at digitalization and, and other forms of uh, um, IT platforms which will uh, assist the smallholder communities. So in terms of the impact investment, um, I think it's extremely important that we are able to invest across the value chains that we're operating. And so we've, um, we've been, we have a portfolio currently of around 26 transactions globally. We work in Asia, Africa, and Latin America. We also do investments in the U.S., um, but those are the uh, uh, geography uh, or geographical uh, areas that we focus on. Um, we are looking to scale that business. So for those of you that are here uh, in person and those that are, are uh, virtual, we are looking to partner. So please reach out and uh, we're also in a fundraise uh, um, position currently. So those of you that would like to partner with us to reach the smallholder communities, that's really our expertise. So we look forward to, um, again, the event here today and the partnerships that hopefully develop out of this. Thank you. for those remarks and uh, for those of you um, who haven't seen the papers, as Terry mentioned, there are two of them. Uh, one is on Honduras specifically is the case study that I mentioned. There's another paper as well about uh, small scale agriculture with a more global uh, lens. And I encourage everyone in the audience who hasn't seen those papers yet to, uh, to go and have a look at them. They're on our, on our website. Um, it's my pleasure now to introduce our, our superlative panel for, for this event. Uh, immediately to my left is Patrick Starr. Relationships Director for Africa at the U.S. Development Finance Corporation. He brings a wealth of policy, private sector, and on-the-ground experience to this role. Patrick also serves as the co-chair of the Food Security and Agriculture Working Group at the DFC. Our next panelist is uh, Irena Arias Hoffman, Chief Executive Officer at the IDB Group Innovation Laboratory. Under her direction, the lab uses tools financing, knowledge, and connections to create, to co-create projects and support entrepreneurship. Previously, she worked with the International Finance Corporation where she managed the IFC's largest portfolio of $16 billion. And our fourth and final, uh, our third uh, and final panelist is Somya Krishnamurthy, Director of Partnerships and Sustainable Finance at the Pan American Development Foundation. She is a small and medium enterprise specialist with more than 10 years of experience working on improving access to finance, innovative financing, and development programs throughout Latin America and the Caribbean. I've asked each one of our panelists today to make about five minutes of opening remarks, and we'll start with you, Patrick. So over to you for your opening remarks. Great, thank you so much, first of all, to CSIS um, and the team for having me here. Thank you for allowing me to speak and participate in this uh, important event. Um, just uh, the way I'll frame my remarks, just a, a few key points at the beginning and then a few uh, comments on our food security work and then a few ways that we're aiming to innovate as the DFC. Um, <clears throat> so the Development Finance Corporation, we, um, hard to believe, launched over three years ago um, and uh, it's been a strong three years with a renewed mandate to focus on investments in the poorest countries in the world, specifically in uh, low and lower middle income countries. 
um, we have been um, maintaining a focus on the, the most important investments in those countries, which as we've acknowledged here, uh, in many cases, um, the agriculture sector is one of the most important contributors to the economies. So food security remains a very key priority of ours um, as, we, uh, as we investigate um, and maintain our pipeline and, uh, and uh, future opportunities. So, um, you know, I think incorporating the private sector and smallholder farmers is something that we do uh, acknowledge as a crucial piece of uh, maintaining the strength of value chains within countries and, um, and you know, that's, that's just an important area that we strive to do uh, even more in. One year ago at um, the UN General Assembly, we announced um, an initiative to uh, invest $1 billion in food security uh, investments over five years. Uh, and over the, pa over the past year, we've actually made pretty good, uh, good significant progress towards that milestone. Um, this past year, fiscal year 22, we invested over $600 million. Um, so, uh, so we've made good strides towards that and we're expecting those uh, investments to impact over 1 million small scale farmers. Um, so just a few notes on our food security strategy and some of our, some of our recent results. We work in concert with um, many um, uh, separate individual US government agencies in implementing the Feed the Future initiative and the global food security strategy um, as dictated by, uh, by Congress. So we, we do have a, a very um, cross uh, interagency approach to, um, to our work. Um, predominantly, we, uh, we work with USAID's Bureau for Resilience and Food Security in coordinating our investments um, in three uh, key topic areas, including agriculture-led growth, inclusion and sustainability, um, and then resilience, including in the face of, of climate, um, uh, climate shocks. Um, so wherever possible, we do try to center our investments um, on small-scale farmers and, uh, and smallholders um, specifically. So the DFC's development strategy is called the uh, Roadmap for Impact. Um, if you haven't had a chance um, to see that, it is on our website um, and it is our uh, sort of our guiding North Star. Um, and that calls for DFC to connect at least one million uh, small scale farmers to global markets um, over five years. Uh, but um, as I said, <laughs> yeah, the, opening, um, the opening points, we've, uh, we've pretty much exceeded that here in our, our first, uh, the first year alone. So, um, so we're, we're happy to be, uh, to be making significant progress in this space. Um, so food security remains obviously just a very key piece of our strategy as an organization um, and, uh, and we do um, uh, consider it an important part of the Feed the Future initiative um, <clears throat> globally. So just in ways that we're uh, aiming to innovate as an organization, we've obviously made lots of progress, but um, I think as the papers have, um, have indicated and, and several thought pieces have, Recently pointed out, we do still have you know, a pretty long way to go in addressing the, the financing gaps in especially reaching small-scale um, farmers. So one of the first ways that, we try, that we're trying to, uh, to do more is focusing on um, specialization. Um, and we acknowledge that, of course, agriculture is a difficult sector to finance, um, as evidenced by the, uh, by the financing uh, gaps and other um, you know, special specialties, that it special knowledge that it requires. Um, so we, we aim to support and work through um, intermediaries and with private enterprises that do show that specialty. And I think one recent um, example is our work supporting um, the Responsibility Climate Smart Ag and Food Systems Fund. Um, and that fund is focused on um, uh, early stage um, ag enterprises and making investments um, in innovative technologies um, on the, along the agricultural value chain. And we've uh, supported them with a, uh, with a second loss credit guarantee on that front to help um, mitigate some of the downside risk. Um, another way that we're seeking to, to innovate is localization. Um, I think it's, it's no uh, mystery that being close to the small holder farmers and small scale producers is important in this sector, um, especially so um, trying to bring our resources as close as we can to the, um, to the uh, small scale producers is, uh, is something that we're trying to do more of, recognizing we're a small team. Uh, we do have a team of six Africa investment advisors that we've recruited over the past few years. They're based um, uh, geographically around the continent of Africa that are helping us to do that. Um, but we also do, um, uh, we don't have a uh, dedicated foreign service or, or any group of personnel that, that is um, you know, on the ground for us. So we do seek um, innovative ways to try to get close to the borrowers um, and beneficiaries that we're targeting. Thirdly is on the innovation front, um, I think there have been many, many um, very important breakthroughs in digital technologies and closing that distance between uh, small-scale producers um, and uh, sources of finance and information in general. 
Um, for us, one example, um, we, um, we, we made a direct investment um, in the uh, Inshu Resilience Investment Fund, $37.5 million, um, and their work, supporting their work in um, developing innovative insurance products to help um, ensure that smallholder farmers uh, are able to weather the effect of uh, climate shocks effectively. Uh, and then the, the last piece that I've already alluded to is just deeper collaboration um, with our uh, Feed the Future interagency government um, colleagues. I mentioned USAID, but we work also very closely with MCC, the Peace Corps, um, the State Department, um, certainly trying to seek out ways that we can partner very closely with them, but then also with private foundations like the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, the Rockefeller Foundation, other folks um, in the field where we can uh, invest alongside um, or, or leverage each other's strengths. That's something that we are, uh, are seeking to do more of and find those efficiencies in the markets. Um, earlier this year, as an example, we invested uh, $3.75 million in Chicoa Fish Farm, uh, and that's in Mozambique to help them um, with their food security and uh, resilience in the face of droughts. Um, they were um, an organization that's been already um, uh, assisted by IDH FarmFit, uh, which is a USAID uh, uh, supported trade initiative, um, as well as uh, gain the Global uh, Alliance for Improved Nutrition. So seeking out those opportunities where we can um, uh, leverage the strengths of other players in the market, um, other um, like-minded um, uh, organizations is important for us as we uh, seek to work as efficiently as we can. So I'll stop there and turn it over to my other colleagues to uh, also present. Thank you. Fantastic. Thanks very much, Patrick, for those opening remarks. Over to you, Irina, for yours. Thank you, and thank you to CSIS, and, and thank you, Terry, from IFA for the introduction as well. Um, it's a pleasure to be here. Um, Irene Arias, I'm the CEO of IDB Lab. It's the innovation arm or laboratory of the IDB. Uh, just a little bit of intro, so m most of you, of course, um, uh, are familiar with the IDB as the main development finance provider for Latin America and the Caribbean. Uh, but just uh, in terms of our role and, and how we complement uh, other organizations like DFC, uh, we work closely with the public arm of IDB um, uh, that provides around $14 billion of fi public financing to the region, as well as IDB Invest. Uh, they do around uh, $8, 9000000000 billion of financing to the mainstream private sector. Our role as IDB Lab is to um, work with the disruptors and the innovators across the region. So our ticket sizes are much smaller. We deploy about 100 million across 100 projects a year. Uh, but embedded in every office of the IDB in the 26 countries and, and addressing um, the, some of the major challenges uh, by bringing new business models and innovation. And of course, now more and more the availability uh, of, of new technologies. And I was actually just recently with Elizabeth Macomba uh, discussing opportunities on Web3 with Hyper and other organizations that are realizing the enormous potential that this has for addressing um, some of the major challenges and not repeating old recipes uh, to address persistent problems that have become uh, much worse through the pandemic. And one of those, of course, is um, food security and it's the livelihood of small farmers across the region. So in the case of Latin America and the Caribbean, uh, we're talking about um, more than uh, 56 million uh, people that could potentially be in deep hunger if we don't address this, and also uh, livelihoods that represent in the rural sector in Latin America and the Caribbean about 80% um, of the rural properties and, and more than 65% of the jobs. And be, being so well endowed, and the region being so well endowed, um, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a, some, a, a, both a, a, a challenge and an opportunity. The challenge comes obviously from, from the lack of productivity, from the lack of connection to markets, big intermediation, uh, a few very large farms that do well, but uh, the, the, when we're talking about the small, the small farmers, um, a, lot of, um, a lot of challenges in uh, that, um, even though we can see the potential for new solutions and uh, precision agriculture and new technologies to be able to address them, it's taken a long time for all these models to truly be adapted, affordable, efficient, and built with the small farmers as users in mind. Uh, but we're, we're seeing that. So in, on the 
turn into the solution and seeing what we see as, as the potential, we've seen the emergence of a thousand actics in the last four or five years, and they've attracted more than $400 million in capital, uh, but few of them were truly addressing the needs of small-scale farmers. So um, we're very happy to see that we're turning that corner. So we invested through, we invest both through venture capital funds and through and directly into startups. And we invested through one of the funds, SP Ventures, um, in AgroSmart, um, a leading ag tech in Brazil. And a few years ago, they were too reliant on hardware, et cetera, to, to develop solutions for precision agriculture, better use of inputs, et cetera. Fast forward to today, we just made a direct investment in them because they have been able to combine and adapt that, they, their, their solution to something that is much more adaptable and affordable for, for small-scale farmers. So we see a, we see a transition there. Um, the other macro trend and opportunity that we see is that, of course, this global conversation around food security and uh, how to um, support effectively small farmers is, is also being um, integrated into the discussion around sustainability and climate change. And for the first time at the COP in Cairo, there was an agricultural um, focus. And, 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 and I think that that also will um, bring the financing part, because a, 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 if we look at projects that are doing both addressing productivity, but also um, a, bringing in more sustainable practices, and um, it will be able to harness a lot of the models that are looking for addressing climate targets, but applied to uh, improving, improving opportunities for small scale farmers, which was not happening before. Um, and I look forward to the rest of the discussion so we can share real examples of, of, of uh, the opportunities that we see for investing and maybe for, for collaborating as well. Thank you very much, Irena. Uh, Somia, your opening remarks. Thank you, Ryan. Uh, so happy to be here. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you, CSIS, for having me and to be part of this panel. Uh, my name is Samia Krishnamurti. I'm with the Pan American Development Foundation. So we have a slightly different perspective from the DFC or the IDB, but very complementary, I think. Uh, just a brief uh, background. We're turning 60 this year, uh, and we were established to build greater partnerships between public, private, and civil society actors in Latin America and the Caribbean, and to facilitate connections between the Americas. And so very true to that, our experience and what I'm going to talk about here is really driven a lot by direct implementation, the voice of the smallholder farmers, the voice of local actors, the voice of local banks. But bringing that up to see what are some regional trends, what are some regional partnerships, and how best can we advance global goals through what we're doing in Latin America and the Caribbean. Uh, some of the things that I want to talk about today, and I see some of them already being mentioned, uh, the first is the role of digitize, digitization, uh, particularly post-COVID. Uh, we're seeing a real drive across multiple sectors and in investments in technology, but also a greater acceleration and adoption of technology. And we're certainly seeing and hopeful of seeing more of this trend in agriculture in Latin America and the Caribbean. Some of the things that we've been excited about is that technology has been progressing across multiple lens that affect smallholder farmers. There is greater access to technology that allows farmers to now manage and pro pro project out their own expenses. Think about farmholder expenses. There is technology that allows them to see the big picture view. We've adopted some of this in our work in Haiti. How can we use GIS mapping? How can we use drones? How can we really help them translate data to action? And then there's also technology around farm gate pricing. There's technology around access to markets. And so there is, uh, I think, a tipping point in how technology is culminating. And we're seeing that hopefully having a very positive impact on smallholder farmers. The second trend that I think connects very much to this is attracting youth and bringing entrepreneurship and an excitement around agriculture back to farming communities to see what, what social impact does that have. How do we then wrap around the issues that maybe we have around youth unemployment, the, the role of organized crime in agriculture. How do we counter those movements with the attraction of youth? 
Um, and I think we're seeing a lot. Uh, we've done some great work in Honduras. I'm glad you referenced that, Brian. Uh, we had an incubator accelerator specifically around how can youth adopt climate smart agriculture technologies to start or scale up businesses. And we saw a lot of uh, excitement and energy around that. And then uh, the, they're connected, closely connected to that is also the important but significantly different lens you need to take to address the needs of women in agriculture. What role do they play as smallholder farmers? What can we do more? And what are their access to financing needs? And what are their access to technology needs? And it looks very different. And you can't even paint a lens across Latin America or the Caribbean, let alone the world. It really looks very different region to region, culturally very localized context. And the last trend that I would like to pick up on what Irina said is regenerative agriculture and the connection between traditional and indigenous forms of agriculture and how can you really lean into that to address the needs of climate change, to drive financing and to respect views of agriculture, views of how food systems play in cultural beliefs and social beliefs while recognizing that there are lags in productivity there are great improvements to be made, but not imposing forms of agriculture that just end up recreating cycles of poverty and, and disparities in wealth um, and power. So I think there is a lot to talk about. I think the perspectives are going to be very uh, different depending on where in the region or where in the world you're talking about. But I think a common thread that I think all of us are saying up here, and I'm sure resonate with all of your experience, is, is centralizing the experience of smallholder farmers and developing solutions that fit their needs rather than a big impetus to change their behavior patterns to, to de-risk themselves, to be more attractive financing. How can we meet them where they are and how can we make sure that we are servicing them? Financing, technical advisory services, they all carry service in their name and title and so I think we really want to lean into that and that's what I would like to talk about today. Great to be here. Thank you very much, Somia. Thanks to all of our panelists for opening remarks. Before we jump into the moderated portion of the discussion, I want to remind folks in the audience, if you've got a question, something that's popped into your head, you've got these QR codes on either side of the, of the uh, stage here, scan it with your phone and you'll come up with a, uh, a website you can input your question. If you're out there in our live virtual audience, you've got a button on the website through which you're viewing the live stream. It says Ask Live Question. Click there and uh, you'll be able to input a question as well. Um, I've got a question for the entire panel. Something that came up in our desk research for our, for our project, something that came up time and, time and again in our field work, was this concept of the missing middle. Right? Um, and it's, it's there in the two papers as well if you access them. Um, so I wanted to ask, you know, why has this proven so persistent? I, I get the sense that we could have had this conversation, this, this panel, five years ago or 10 years ago, and maybe that some of the technologies we would talk about, some of the solutions, would be slightly different because we've advanced since then. But we're still talking about a missing middle. So I want to hear from, from each one of you about this, and I'll start with you, Somya, and go in reverse order with the opening remarks. So why has this been so persistent? Um, I think it's been persistent because I think we haven't been able to tackle some of those systemic factors. And I think we have, we've all tried to introduce programs that are socially relevant and, and innovative and trying to you know, push through changes. But some of those root causes of the missing middle are, are big picture conversations that require concerted action between very different stakeholders and they don't always have aligned interests and so I think that's a big part of it and I also think the missing middle you're right I think we could have had that conversation 15 or 20 years ago and it might have still been is very true but I do think that it's not a uniform case of the missing middle now uh, it's not it's the missing middle in Mexico looks very different from the missing middle in Haiti. And I'm sure if we stretch that example to South Asia or Africa, the disparities are even bigger. Um, and so I think today then, post-COVID, it becomes important to start to nuance that missing middle a little bit more. Uh, and I will say, for instance, in Haiti, for where I've spent some time living and we have a lot of programming, uh, the missing middle today looks far worse than it did uh, five years ago. And a big part of that is the political situation in Haiti, 
whereas I think we've seen a lot of advances on things that we think would address the missing middle gap. We've seen greater adoption of technology. We've seen greater digital financial services. We've seen greater desire uh, among entrepreneurs to, to embrace agriculture. We've seen greater access to markets. Uh, we've seen more value added interventions, value chain interventions, and I think those are all checking the boxes to see the progress in the missing middle, but we don't see it in reality. The data doesn't support that. And so I think that then says that when we want to tackle the missing middle, these are, these are really systemic issues and we need to have very, very coordinated actions and a real target. We need to set targets by country, by region, and even within you know, smallholder farmers coexist with large farms. Those, those things matter too to, to uh, subordinate the missing middle. So I think these are, these are, that's the reason why I think we, have, we could have had this conversation many years ago and still be talking about it. Irena? Yeah, I think the, there was also, it's a question of the maturity of these new frontiers, new industries. Um, if you look at FinTech itself and FinTech and addressing the needs of just regular sort of urban population, it's probably the most mature, and and they they, I think uh, initially there was a lot of fear from banks, feeling like they were getting into their business. In reality, when you look at it now and and and, uh, and see at least in Latin America and the Caribbean, of the of the sort of 15 billion dollar industry that venture has grown into, most of it is going to fintech and SaaS, and and and. A lot of it, the, you know, lives very well with the existing financial institutions. They've just taken greenfield opportunities in the brownfield. They haven't really uh, it's done a lot of their business. So I think it's, it, it's the maturity level that we've seen there is now permeating into uh, solutions and financial access solutions for um, agriculture. So fin like. Mm, ag fintech sort of combined and 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 we just need to be open to where the those new champions will come from because they may not be at all uh, well they certainly are not going to be from the incumbent financial institutions because they hardly reach those sectors so it's a very good greenfield opportunity but it may also not come from just uh, investing in, in a standalone um, fintechs that maybe have a, a very a, not a very scalable model instead if you look at what happened for example in logistics uh, or all these uh, embedded finance plays right Brazil um, cargo X now called frete they completely transformed the efficiency of the logistics sector. And now they are one of the main finance providers for trackers that were not banked. And um, so why it, it, one of the reasons they were very successful was that they were linking shipping lines with individual trackers. So almost like a similar concept that you could Uberize also the provision of credit for small scale farmers in the same way, building on the logistics platform platform, like Mercado Libre has done with Mercado Credito, translating those same type of models where you start with something else. You're solving, for example, the, the access to markets and the commercialization aspect, but then you start harnessing a lot of the data and building an embedded finance model there. So connecting, I think, and it's the last point, connecting um, some of the bigger players from the cooperatives to the buyers um, into these a change and then building on top of that an embedded finance model, I think that could be part of the part of the solution. So we really need to break away from expecting that banks are just going to move downscale. Um, and lastly, um, there are other ways, unexpected ways, that small-scale farmers can monetize the, their assets. And by the way, Back to the, the point about uh, them becoming more productive, but at the same time more resilient and with better environmental practices. An example, Quilimo in Argentina, it's working on water savings for small scale farmers, combining nano data from nanosatellites and other sources and offering them advice as well as a, 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 an interface so that they can have the traceability of the water savings. Microsoft is buying these water credits 
Actually, they, they, the first pilot on the water credits was in Maipo, Chile. So this is a new source of financing as, as well for small-scale farmers. I think that they, we just starting to see a whole new horizon, it's not going to come from the traditional financial system. Thank you very much, Irena. Patrick, anything sure. to add to yeah, that? Yeah, I think um, I'll probably just uh, underline um, some of what my fellow panelists have said, and I think, you know, just to directly answer your question about why the gap still exists, I think part of it is that there are lots of um, long and deeply held assumptions about what characterizes the missing middle, and if you're approaching this from a financial institution's perspective, um, there, are, there is a lack of understanding about how exactly to approach a sector, especially uh, one so hard to finance as, as agriculture. So chipping away and, um, and understanding and sharing and making more transparent some of the data around what exactly constitutes a farmer or a small-scale producer or um, a, 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 a member in the uh, ag value chain who is, who's stuck in the missing middle, who can't access financing. I think that's, that's an, important, um, an important aspect to acknowledge and I think one that we're starting to see, especially with some of these technology platforms, um, uh, increased transparency and, um, and, and increased ability for um, financial institutions to leverage that information and, uh, and actually contribute to uh, financing the missing middle. I think you know, one, one initiative that we've engaged with as the, uh, as the DFC um, and, uh, and one that I think is doing a lot of good work would be um, the Aseli Africa initiative in East Africa. Um, <clears throat> and this is uh, sort of a, an organization that has uh, spun out of, not spun out of, but has evolved from the Council on Smallholder Agriculture Finance. Um, and what they've done just by analyzing the specific criteria about what a small producer in the ag sector looks like in terms of um, profit, how profitable are they or aren't they, uh, and being able to share some of that information on a portfolio level with a financial institution has allowed them to, um, to unlock um, significant financing from commercial, domestic commercial institutions for exactly what we're trying to, uh, to, to attack here, the, the missing middle. So I think those, those kinds of data um, initiatives certainly do help uh, contribute to, uh, to the conversation and I think are um, doing exactly what, what we're talking about here, you know, leveraging the data and the technology platforms um, and, uh, and sharing that broadly allows us um, all to, to address the, uh, the challenge better. Um, and at the DFC specifically, we do have um, a few initiatives that are aiming to get at this program, uh, this, this problem a little bit. Um, we aren't obviously as a DFI um, investing in smallholder farmers directly, but we do work with organizations that work with smallholder farmers um, through our portfolio for impact and innovation. It's a window uh, that's focused on early stage enterprises and um, early stage ag enterprises are, are a priority. Um, as well as the Africa Small Business Catalyst Program is another, um, another window that we've uh, opened for early stage um, and, uh, and innovative enterprises, um, uh, specifically smaller. So um, we, we are doing our best as well to innovate and, uh, and, and um, uh, address the challenge. Wonderful. I want to talk about climate change. It's something that came up in, in uh, every, everybody who offered opening remarks mentioned climate change at, at, at one point. And, and so I want to ask, um, from each of your perspectives and from each of your organizations, you know, what kind of investments, what kind of financial mechanisms or instruments are needed uh, to get us to a point where we are more resilient uh, in terms of the climate shocks. It's something we heard in Honduras time and again in our field work. And I'll go in reverse order this time, so Patrick, you first, and then, and then this one. And if you could give examples from, from your organization or from, from, your, you know, from your field of study, in your case, Africa and Latin America. That would be great, of investments that you think are really making uh, an impact. I always think it's important to concretize this as well with, with real life examples. Yeah, so perhaps it might not come as too much of a surprise just given where I'm coming from at the DFC and the Mission Transaction Unit. We do have a long history of uh, structuring credit guarantees um, in our time when we uh, were at USAID and now at the DFC, um, continue to work with our USAID mission colleagues and, um, uh, and, and focus on uh, bringing the full toolkit of the DFC to address the address the challenges that each USAID mission is um, is is tackling locally, but I do think that especially when we're looking at um, climate shocks and when we're looking at um, uh, the impacts that they could have on a portfolio of small scale producers, that something like a credit guarantee does allow us to um, to work with a, a a local commercial financial institution while not crowding out other perhaps um, innovative or, or or local investors. Um, and allows us to uh, to um, absorb some of that uh, some of that 
some of the losses that might result from a shock that might um, cause a small scale producer to default on a loan. Um, so, so I do think that, you know, specifically the credit guarantee tool is one that we've used quite a bit in the, uh, in the ag space um, and one that we uh, continue to deploy. One a very recent example would be with ABSA Bank in Zambia. Um, it's, a, it's a market that is obviously very, um, still very much um, uh, ag focused and, and, and agriculture contributes quite a bit to the economy. Um, and uh, is indeed one of the, the uh, key development points of the national development plan of the country. Um, and here uh, we have, in cooperation with USAID, developed a, uh, a credit guarantee that would allow the bank to do more of this kind of investing, especially on um, smaller scale uh, enterprises in the ag space. Um, and, uh, and, and this sort of just a little bit of a sweetening of the pot, putting our fingers on the scale a little bit allows them to take a closer look at SMEs um, and smaller enterprises that may not have otherwise been attractive or, or they just wouldn't have been able to invest in given their credit policies. So, um, so allowing for that type of uh, additional, uh, to take additional steps, um, take on just a little bit more risk um, is something that we do uh, seek to do with our uh, structuring these credit guarantee um, uh, transactions and one that we've seen to be um, successful. Irena? Yeah, I think the, for the uh, it's both uh, climate change in terms of uh, mitig in terms of mitigation, of course, but where from the angle of uh, innovation and tapping into new models and technology, we see the biggest opportunities on adaptation. Um, and I think since Glasgow for the first time, that was captured as explicit aim that, uh, and, and, and given a lot of relevance. Um, and, and there, I, I think there are, um, um, the challenge is to in, in, ensure that we integrate a lot of the solutions that we open up more channels for collaboration and that these solutions are not isolated uh, but it's more kind of looking for this kind of composability. So if you are thinking of, thinking of it almost like an operating system where you have layers and building blocks um, uh, to, to, to make sure that we can, we can more quickly deploy um, uh, uh, good solutions for a uh, for, for, for farmers, for example, in, in Peru, we're working with Agros, a company that is specifically working with uh, farming communities on helping them become part of the digital economy. So working on the identi uh, digital identification and uh, working on, the, on, on blockchain. We have a large initiative that I invite you all to look into and maybe be, be part of called Lackchain. Uh, which has become the largest interoperable blockchain network in, in the region. And why is that relevant for, for climate? Is that it's allowing us to um, deploy a smarter solutions that can both work on traceability of inputs, ensuring that you know, there, are, there is less waste, that there is better price um, discovery, that is less intermediation, and that farmers are, are a, a lot more productive, and all of that helps in the end uh, make more resilient and sustainable practices. So that in a way is one way of addressing that question. Um, and um, and I, 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 th I think that the, that we, we need to, we need to uh, uh, look uh, beyond, beyond just um, the big headlines of CO2 emissions. So I, I'm very encouraged that we see more and more attention on adaptation and, and, and all of these integrations of these different solutions so, so that we have a systemic impact in almost like tackling the issue at the source. Uh, uh, and, and avoiding the long-term impacts. Wonderful. Sonia? Yeah, I would agree with, with what both Patrick and Irina said, and I would say for us a uh, couple of things that have been really impactful in our work to, to think through climate change. The first is blended finance. As a financing tool, uh, we have an ongoing mechanism in the Eastern Caribbean and it's looking at resilience in a post-COVID world across sectors. And across sectors, I think blended finance has a lot to offer because you have a lot of creativity and flexibility in how you adapt 
to the needs of the sector, to the needs of the enterprise, um, and to the needs of smallholder farmers. But in agriculture in particular, in the Caribbean, where climate change and food security are so intricately linked, I think it blended finances, at least for us, given us a way to, to think about what are the complex needs around resilience that all need to be addressed regardless of what sector you're in. And then how do you layer on the fact that climate change ad adaptation specifically in the Caribbean offers up a lot of opportunities for investment, offers up new technology, offers up access to new markets, and addresses food security needs. And so it, uh, it, it's just the idea that you introduce a new, new financing mechanism, at least that's our experience, opens up a lot of conversations from people who have become disillusioned with the system or have not even thought about financing resilience as something that is a viable business model. So j that has been very powerful. The other thing that I would say in both Honduras and Haiti, the incubator accelerator model has also been very, very successful, at least for us, is a lot of the times it's access to technology, data, and information, which we've all talked about. But actionable versions of those. It's very easy for farmers to sit down and attend a training and realize that there are a multitude of digital financial service options for them that they can access and see their data about their farm plot from drone pictures. But the step further is when an incubator accelerator actually gives them tailored services that allows them to take that data think about their past business performance, think about what they, what they see as market trends, and then plan ahead. And I think it's in that planning and the resilience that comes in, the discipline of sitting through, and, and also connecting with a peer network, all of which incubators and accelerators do. Um, I love also from a very selfish perspective, maybe from our perspectives, an easy point of entry for scalability. And so I think the combination, uh, we've seen this in Haiti in particular, was really heartening. It's, it's a couple of years old now, but a program that we ran that supported uh, multiple sectors. It resulted in 45 enterprises. It was a USAID program called LEAD. We supported 45 enterprises with a mix of grant capital with debt and equity from local financial institutions. Agriculture was one of the biggest sectors that were successful. And banks in Haiti that had traditionally been quite risk averse to lending in agriculture were really excited by the fact that grant capital and technical advisory services so closely accompanied their investment. And I think uh, I think there are models and networks already in place to tap into that. I think blended finance combined with incubator accelerator, our experience in Honduras and Haiti, really can be a way in which to channel climate change specific investments. Um, the other one that I would say is in Colombia, we're doing a project which touches hundreds of farmers in, in the Tumaco region, a region that's really known for illicit crop coca production and regenerative agriculture and rethinking how their traditional means of farming can actually allow them to access new crops, whether it's coffee, cacao, exotic citrus fruits, et cetera, and the markets that come with them against, with the notion that by working in regenerative agriculture, by emphasizing the benefits to the world at large, honestly, when we talk about the ecosystem benefits of new models of agriculture, they're very excited and it reaffirms their commitment to moving away from illicit to licit crop production. And that's tackling the big challenge of climate change. That's allowing them to access new financing. But what really they care about, it allows them to reimagine their social capital within society. And that means a lot. And so I think when it comes to the issue of smallholder farmers and Seeing, uh, seeing challenges around climate adaptation, climate mitigation, there are going to be a lot of levers that we need to press. Uh, and financing is a big lever, but as long as we package it around the other services that matter, and again, that changes by context, I think that can, that's been very successful in our experience. Thank you very much, Somia. At this portion, uh, this point of the event, I want to uh, get to some of the questions from the audience. We have uh, one of our America's program coordinators in the back, Ruby Bledsoe, with a microphone. I have seen some photos, uh, people snapping photos of the scan, uh, the, the QR code up here to scan. So I think we have a couple questions, and, and Ruby's going to read them out, and I'll direct them to, to various people on the panel. Thanks, Ryan. Our first question comes from Lawrence from Schaefer Global Management, LLC. His question is, how relevant do you see control environment agriculture, like aquaponics, as a viable solution for food production in developing countries? All right. I think we could ask all of you for a quick, like a quick lightning round here of, of uh, start with you, Patrick, and 
could you, is, was it a hydroponics? Is that what you said? The aquaponics. Aquaponics. Yeah. Um, well, I do think that um, certainly for, for us from the DFC, um, any and all uh, innovative approaches to, uh, uh, to, um, to agricultural production, and especially here, as we might see in um, sort of uh, compact spaces and, um, and uh, especially urban, urban areas, I think, would be um, uh, very, very attractive opportunities for us. Um, and, um, you know, we would probably, um, you know, look for, uh, you know, to, to channel invest an investment into a company like that um, through either one of our uh, smaller windows, like the, the Portfolio for Impact for uh, Impact and Innovation, or through something like the Africa Small Business Catalyst Program. Um, but I do think that, you know, these, these innovative approaches to, um, you know, food security challenges are uh, definitely of interest to, uh, to us in the DFC and to the U.S. government as a whole through the Feed the Future initiative and the Global Food Security Strategy. So, you know, I, I think in terms of just the, um, the, the potential behind it, I think um, we, we all want to see um, these sort of uh, innovative approaches that allow us to, uh, to, to address the, the, the challenges that we're, that we're all collectively trying to, to overcome. Irena, Somia? Sure. Uh, yeah, it definitely is a trend that we've seen have mixed results in the Caribbean, in the Eastern Caribbean. It's, it's very relevant. We're seeing a lot of interest in that. And I think that's directly connected to two factors, COVID um, and the over-reliance on tourism. There has been a, a huge trend around importation of certain vegetables that act, and fruits that actually are very well suited for control system agriculture, aquaponics, greenhouses, et cetera. And so the fact that with COVID, the tourism sector took such a, a deep hit in that region, the fact that at the same time, food security and food imports were making the national news almost every day, I think sparks a lot of interest and, and desire to, to push that technology. And as a result, we've seen a lot of interest from enterprises who traditionally weren't in that space or had been in that space and looking to scale. So I think in certain contexts, yes, absolutely. The one where I've seen more mixed results has been in Haiti, um, where I think the infrastructure that, that's required, the investments that need to happen, it's not just the investment in controlled ag, it's the access to markets, it's cold storage, it's, uh, it's, it's beyond that, it's, it's about the belief that you know this is, this is really a crop that you should be, there are a lot of cultural factors around it too. So I think, I, think it would, I wouldn't say it's a universal yes, but definitely a trend we're seeing and tracking and, and seems to be working for some parts of the region. Irena, would you like to add anything to that? No, no? I think it was what okay. yeah. Ruby, next question. Yes, thank you. Our second question comes from Rebecca from the Intern American Foundation. What do you see as the role of investing in civil society organiza organizations such as cooperatives and farmers associations to reach smallholder farmers through mechanisms like savings and loan groups? Irena, do you want to, since, since uh, it was the role of investing in, in cooperatives. Oh, in cooperatives, yeah. yeah. And other NGO groups. Mm. Would you like to tackle that one since you yeah, didn't speak sure. on Yeah, um, sure. We, we actually just approved a month ago a, an interesting project with Cooperativa Naranjito in Paraguay. Um, and, I, and I think it speaks to uh, this idea that, you know, all the in different institutions, they still have a really important role to play, even as the landscape is changing and the kinds of solutions at hand are changing. And it's not like now we're just moving to ag fintechs and co-ops are no longer relevant. They're actually super important um, actor to aggregate those, um, those small scale far farmers. I mean, in, in, we're talking about 16 million small scale farmers in Latin America and the Caribbean, um, these co-ops play an enormous role in uh, bringing them together, understanding and, and translating and, and co-designing uh, solutions that need to be certainly adapted to the local context. So uh, we are channeling through Cooperativa Naranjito both financing, but also uh, to Somnia's point, uh, a lot of the advice and the, the technical support for the adaptation of uh, new technologies in precision ag 
for their farmers, and we couldn't, we couldn't do it. So it's a, very, it's a slightly different, uh, it's helping in some ways their own digital transformation, while, uh, um, that, and, and they, they, they are still a very strong pillar. So we, we, um, that's from the sort of innovation and technology side, um, and in terms of just generally financing uh, co-ops to online to, to small farmers, of course, our, Mm, the arm of, you know, IDB Invest continues to do that on a mainstream sort of basis. Uh, Ruby, we're almost at time, but I think if there's one more, we would have, we would have time for one more. Okay. Um, yes, yeah, Sonia, a consultant, asks, smallholder for farmers tend to be in rural areas that lack services like roads, internet service, healthcare, et cetera. Is it possible to have successful projects when the basic conditions like roads and internet to connect to farmers, connect farmers to markets are imperfect? Okay, so a question about infrastructure and the role of infrastructure and all of this. Patrick, you started nodding your head, so yeah. why don't you yeah. go okay, ahead. Okay, sure, yeah, well, real quickly, yes, I think the answer to that is, is for sure um, working on those critical pieces of infrastructure is, is a priority of the DFC and one where I think a development finance, finance institution actually is particularly well suited to, to play a role. Um, so, so that is something that we, that we do, that we have prioritized, continue to prioritize, especially looking at the information communication technologies, the um, uh, connection to uh, digital infrastructure, um, both um, you know, wireless and, and, and Wi-Fi and construction of actual physical infrastructure in terms of roads. Um, that, is, that is definitely something that um, you know, is, is obviously, it's a, a critical piece of reaching that, that last mile to some of these, uh, to some of these, the smallest of the small scale farmers that are particularly remote um, and is, is a critical piece to just a country's development as a whole. So I think you know, um, helping to stand alongside private sector investors um, and, and crowd in some of that investment to, um, to fund a, a, a country's journey as they, um, as they uh, address some of these challenges is, is a very key, key role for us as, as a DFI. So for sure um, acknowledged and one that we, we try to, to, to work with um, either through directly through the DFC or through MCC USAID in cooperation with our, our other government agencies. I don't know if you- Somia, did you have something to add? Yeah, I would, I would echo that. First, I would say just thank you for a great question because I think it is, it is situating the complexity of, of rural development. And I think for us, a lot of that is, as you said, aligning where private sector investments might address some of those if they're making investments in their supplier value chain and then complementing that by working very intensely with local governments and other local stakeholders to prioritize what those other needs are and to coordinate the driving of investments because you don't want people working at cross purposes and that happens more often than we would like to, to think or admit. Um, and so that's very important. For instance, um, in Haiti we did, uh, we are doing a project called Community Driven Development and that's working across 15 different communes in Haiti. Agriculture is a key economic actor in at least 10 of those. And when you try to address what the needs of the community are, these infrastructure needs come through over and over again. And so if we were to go to a bank and say, now we're able to say, we, this, this enterprise requires this kind of financing, but complement that by saying, and we know an access road is coming because we see, we've seen that in the plan, or we are able to connect them with the digital infrastructure because there's also support coming in for digital infrastructure for education that can then, that can be leveraged. I think those points of leverage happen very much at the local level and I think anything we can do to support that kind of coordination will lead to more of that, that lasting change that I think we all want to see and acknowledge that agriculture and smallholder farmers are, are living a social, a re deeply rich political, social and economic life and that this investments that we make in improving their productivity, their access to markets, their access to finance, are, should be then complemented by these other key services that they still need, and public and private sector and civil society all have a role to play in that. Thank you, you very much, Sonia. Add, like, in yeah. terms of digital infrastructure to add on top in terms of access to markets, um, we haven't seen yet as much success as we've seen, again, in other, in other types of marketplaces, those that are specifically for um, uh, food value chains have still not scaled to the point that I would have expected uh, to, to happen. In fact, we invested in one such marketplace in Argentina and it failed um, this year. 
So this, despite what you, and this is just the pace of adoption, it has picked up, but it's still, even in Uruguay, which is a fairly digital country, is only 8% in terms of a small scale farm. So it, 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 I think there is a still some, some work to, to, to do there and the, the potential is there, but it's, it's taken a bit longer. Um, but we have um, leading uh, fund managers like the Yield Lab, uh, uh, who are also very global. They have, in fact, a, a, a presence in St. Louis here in the US. And, and they are, uh, I think their um, underlying portfolios are gonna have, uh, I think, good, uh, are, are, are capitalizing this type of high risk ventures where you need this form of venture, early stage venture capital and these forms of specialized um, uh, early stage investing like the one that we provide for Idvilla because you have to have the stomach to uh, have the losses when they happen. But they, in the Yield Lab, as an example, is I think one of the very promising uh, ag funds that, uh, that, that, that is gonna yield and, and fund uh, opportunities that will close some of these uh, market access gaps. Fantastic, thank you. Uh, I'm cognizant of the fact that we've already gone over time. And I'm, I know I'm pushing my luck here, but I'd like to give each one of you about 30 seconds to make some concluding remarks, and I'll start with you, Somia. Come this way. Uh, sure. Uh, I just want to say it's, it's great to be part of this conversation. It's very heartening to see that the issues resonate, and it's also, I think, important, particularly for me as a reminder to myself and my organization, the challenges of Latin America and the Caribbean are, are, are vast, and the opportunities are, are even more vast. But there is a lot of innovation that's happening in throughout the world, and there are some common threads in some of the challenges that smallholder farmers face, and particularly subgroups, whether it's women, uh, youth, etc. And I think coordination meetings like this, not to be glib, I truly mean that, is that sharing of these experiences um, and finding conversation spots to which to share successes and failures are so important. And I think particularly COVID has left us all a feeling of at least feeling more connected to the world and recognizing that there's no one local problem, there are global problems. Uh, I think the challenges of smallholder farmers, we can really tap into that sentiment and, and use that to, to address some of these common challenges, financing, access to markets, access to information, access to digital services. I think there, is, there are ways in which we can use that to scale solutions. Thank you so much. Yes, I'll seconds. say that, you know, this is a great opportunity to um, work even more closely together, particularly on some of the foundational parts of, uh, for example, digital infrastructure that can save all of us so much time. So think open source, think collaborative models, and then on top of that, build each other, you know, build, build solutions on top, and those solutions have to be very local and very much built with the, with the users and local institutions, including cooperatives, have a role to play there. Thank you. Patrick. Sure. Thank you. Well, I got to land this one. That's uh, <laughs> <laughs> close us out. Uh, yeah, no, th I mean, I'm an optimist uh, just by nature. Um, and, you know, I think we spent a lot of time talking about the challenges today. But, um, but I do think that, you know, just even in the course of the past few years, we've seen uh, these technological advances, these innovations um, really help us uh, address many, many of the challenges in the, um, in the missing middle sector. And I think that we are seeing progress. And I think it is a bright future um, for, for financing and, um, and channeling investment to the, um, uh, to the populations that so sorely need it. So um, you know, I think we at the DFC continue to, to prioritize the sector and will continue to feel optimistic about the opportunities that are presented. So we look forward to continuing the dialogue and thank you for having us today. Thank you all so much for this incredibly enriching discussion. There are two papers out there that CSIS has published, one with a case study focus on Honduras, the other one uh, with a global lens. I uh, wanted to, to peg those one, one last time. And uh, thank you so much as well to Heifer for the very important partnership that, that we've had over the last year. Uh, this project wouldn't have been possible without you. So uh, Patrick Starr, the Development Finance Corporation, Adrian and Arias Hoffman of the Inter-American uh, Inter Development Bank, and uh, Somia Krishnamurthy of the Pan-American Development Foundation. Thank you so much for being here, and thank you for coming. <laughs>